okay? Okay, this is going to be a Thursday of concurrency, so I'm glad that this is not the first talk that we'll talk about threads, features, and stuff. I'm Diego, uh, and the name might be ambiguous, but today I'm going to talk about a new programming language that I created and used C11 and 14 mixed to implement the backend. Uh, I'm the talk will be uh, in two parts. First, I'll talk about some features that are going to be used in my language. Then the language itself, I know this is a C++ conference, so the co amount of code will be minimum, just to make sure that we all understand the things, the features that we will implement using C++. And then the, the compiled code that is C++ itself. You can grab the materials from this link. They are the whole code introduced here and as well as the Doppel code itself is available in a, in a GitHub repo. The presentation itself is all also there. Please feel free to interrupt me because since th there are going to be code pieces that might not be familiar, so I, I, I will be happy to uh, explain them to you. First, modern C++. Okay, we have better functional programming support. The concurrency is now in the standard library, so that's a very good feature. The type resolution, the auto keyword, the de declaration type, uh, compile time function, these are good features. And in the end, we now have more readable code for the same performance gain, which is nice. And what, this is what I love <laughs> about C++. And uh, I have a claim that right now, uh, concurrency is a very recent topic that we all uh, somehow uh, use in our own projects and in our distribution code. So it, do, it does uh, des deserve its own kind of paradigm, paradig parad let's say, oh, okay. Uh, and its own kind of languages. And we also have some of those like Erlang. Uh, so, uh, then why do we have so few of those? Uh, because safe code plus concurrency is very hard, especially for a regular programmer. Uh, there are a few solutions, most of them uh, uh, uses immutable data types to make sure that no, there are no data races. And functional programming is a, is a programming type that uh, Interestingly, helps parallel computations to be safe. So, uh, those are a few, some of the approaches. And th another reason for that we we have only a few of those is because the message pass passing algorithms and APIs are not that easy to implement and design. So, the ones that we have are low-level or domain-specific languages. Today, there, was, uh, th there were a few uh, talks about this, libcppa, if you had, if you had a chan chance to attend them, those were very instructive. So, uh, and, and there's this trade-off. If we want to scale more, and if you want to s do less coding for utility stuff, the winner is always scalability, and we end up with co code, dirty code that does good concurrency, so let's change that. And how can we change that? We today uh, we had some examples: distributed databases, message passing libraries. Those were hardcore stuff. Let's minimize that into a single machine. A machine consists of a few cores, and use let's use modern C++ to build this language. Ingredients: first, standard library. Well, uh, the, this library, the atomic library, w will not be used that much. It can be used in the real implementation that is not uh, minimized for this conference. There are uh, pieces of this library, but right now there won't be. Well, we will use things from functional, like std function, futures, and threads, mostly async. Second, we have right now with the, with 
the C++11 specification, we now have variadic templates, which is very nice. So this, with these guys, we are able to do compile time checks for uh, types, and uh, it's a kind of polymorphism that is handled during compile time. So I can do things like this. I can wrap this stain stud async in a different way and pass my callable with its arguments to use it in the future in a lazy way, which is a very nice feature. And uh, there, there we have this guy, deck type, that uh, handles the type resolution and makes the whole wrap, wrapping up uh, more readable. So that's, a, that's the other in ingredient. Then we have these perfect <laughs> structures that's, that has been waited for a long time, lambdas, and actually this, got, this piece of code belongs to C++14. It's, just, uh, it's lamb uh, generic lambdas, I think, what it's called. The type resolution is so smart that I don't need to write any type integers floats. It automatically handles if the type support plus operation between them. I love this code, by the way. And the best thing about them is they can capture environments. So closures are the features of callbacks. They, I, in, in my Doppel code, I use them a lot to implement a, a kind of state machine that we will see in the future. So lambdas are good solutions. OK, the language is called Doppel. It's an abbreviation of data-oriented parallel programming languages. What are those? Let's see. First, uh, let's make sure that this is a proof of concept project that is not uh, that that uh, that may become something else in the future. But right now, uh, it's uh, a project that tries to prove that with the help of the new standards and the library functions and structures, we are able to implement a new language language that is able to do parallel computations. So uh, it must be natively parallel. It must be data oriented to minimize cache misses. We will go into that. And it should be readable. Because why? Because remember the last concurrent code that you have written. It's probably <laughs> there are lots of low level primitives that to uh, manage data races, synchronization. Let's make those implicit. And today C++ a AMP was one of the solutions that was uh, brought by. OK, uh, native to parallel, what, what does it mean? It means that our types are parallel in nature. We will see what does this does mean. So built-in async support, let's make this a language feature, not a function or not a implementation that has been made in the, fun uh, in the language itself. It's a built-in structure. And let's share memory using our user space. Let's build whatever uh, uh, different threads need to access at the same time in a place that is easy to access by every thread that it wants. OK, data-oriented. The main reason we use data-oriented uh, structures and data types in our uh, programs is that uh, once you structure your data in a way that is similar data are close to each other in memory and the order of access is the same as order of placement. You uh, utilize your hardware cache, especially the processor, ca processor cache, uh, the best way. So least, the, the less cache miss we have, the more performance we may have. So this is a compile, compiler detail, but still we should have this in mind. Second, it should be readable. OK, so this is the first piece of code that Doppel has. It's the hello world. There are so many things here. I will, um, I will go every single piece of it in the future. But apologies, because we need these codes to implement our C++ backend. So bear with me for the next few slides. OK, we have our hello world. We have a keyword, which is for defining tasks. We have a range, literal, to state the amount of threads that are being allocated in the compile time. We can give a range to it to make it a parameter. Okay. Are these 
these logical threads or hard threads? Right now, they are uh, stat threads. Uh, the question is, are these uh, logical threads or threads? That, uh, Hardware threads. Right now, they are stat threads. The implementation detail is hidden in the standard library. So this could mean that could actually, if you have spawned 10 threads, that they map to 2. Is, that, is there some sort of mapping between virtual threads and hard threads, or is this literally the threads that are spawned? Uh, the question is, is there any mapping with the hardware th threads with the vir virtual threads, or is it the standard? This is the standard. The thing that, you, that is created by calling stat async. Okay, any, any other questions? Okay. So, uh, the, we can give a range to it. Uh, what the, this, uh, this syntax allows us to specify the amount of threads during compile time uh, with a compile permit, parameter. So, uh, it's a way to restrict the amount of threads that can be created. We can use this special literal to detect the number of hardware threads that are supported by the CPU or the number of cores that CPU provides. So that's a good feature. We have the name of the task and we have this little structure called a state. We all know what state machines are. They are things that jump from a state to another state to do some computations. That's a it's a good ab abstraction for parallel algorithms. So this is a reserved keyword that is that means the main state, the first step that our program is going to be in. And a global binding to print things to our console. It's called output and we write hello world. Let's enhance this a little bit. Let's create our own state and jump to it. Okay, now we start with two threads we in, a, in the, our init uh, state, both print hello, output is uh, in, interestingly uh, mutexed, so there is no overlap between characters. Then we jump to my state. Now you may see that there's the jump uh, call has two different syntax, one is this and the other one is this, and this is by the way an infinite hello world loop, hello, hello world world. The reason is, well, this blocks. We have two guys trying to run this code at the same time. And this, guy, this call means that these two guys has to wait each other in order to jump to this state. There are so many ambiguities here. I'm aware of that. We will get into those here in, in the future. But right now, uh, we should be aware that there are so many dirty codes uh, happens here, so in our implementation we will just work with this. Alright, we can have bindings, they are called members in Doppel. They can have types, they can have other things that we will see. And let's assign our integer 42, add 1 and finish. Okay, now there are a few questions raised, can you see them? Or the reason that there might be some questions that I need to answer. Is it apparent? What is finish? The final state? Sorry? Is finish the final state? Uh, fi uh, the question is, uh, is it the finish the final? The finish is like exit uh, with zero in it. Okay. Is my entire local to the thread? Okay, that's a good question. I will answer that. That's one of the questions. Any other question? Uh, the question was, by the way, uh, is it local to the thread? I will answer that. Okay. Yeah, similar. Is there a race on my int? Uh, the question is, is there a race on my int? No, but the reason we will see in the future. Okay, any other concerns? So in the previous slide. Um, okay. This, uh, let's. the first block and the second one is not. Yeah. So as it runs, I would Yeah, the question is, this one blocks and this one doesn't, so should we expect more hellos here? Yeah, this is an infinite loop that prints hello, hello, world, world, f no, I mean till forever. Two, okay, so this is fixed with two threads only, right? So it's not, not like when you jump back to me, it will spawn two... No, 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 it, it will not spawn. Uh, the question is, uh, once we do that, do we spawn another thread to execute this code, or uh, is it a jump? of the same thread that calls that line, it's the second. So what, what is it blocking on 
here. But, but what is it blocked? All right. Uh, the question is, what is it blocked? How is it? That, how does this work? The two threads are created. They both start from here. They both print hello. Then the first guy gets here, needs to wait the other guy in order to jump here. Oh, so it's a barrier. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of ba barrier that is, uh, that is subjected for these two guys. OK, another question. Uh, is it a barrier that uh, keeps uh, the same jump from executing on multiple threads, on or that one that keeps multiple threads entering the same state? Oh, uh, it's a barrier that is put here, not here. Okay, uh, the question so was... Protects, so it protects the jump? Yeah, uh, the question was, uh, w what does it protect? It protects the jump, so the block is held here. Any other questions? Yeah? So both threads advance to my state at the same time? Right? Yeah. So you said this prints hello, hello, world, world, infinitely. Yes. Is it not possible that it could print hello, hello, world, Hello. Oh, it it may, right, yeah. Because the second transition is not working. Yeah, that's a that's a correct. The question or the statement was, uh, it may uh, write to our console, hello, hello world, hello. Since this is non-blocking, that's true. Yeah. I think so. The, the moral of the story, though, is that one thread, one task can't get ahead of the other one because yes. they both have. To yeah. Uh, the comment was uh, one thread can get at ahead of the other one. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, let's continue. Okay, there are some ambiguities. Let's solve this, but let's ask, ask them first. Who owns this? That's your question. Is this synchronous? Is this synchronous? And what if I want some co code to be executed every time I access this guy? Okay, let's answer those questions one by one. But first we need to see how these members are declared. They have a special syntax to, uh, the, for, to achieve some different semantics. Okay, the syntax starts with a scope semantic, then followed by a, this devil, I can't even pronounce that, monadic semantics. Action semantic, a name and a type. Every single one of these semantics are optional and a question. Yeah. Is there a reason why, and then you go back one slide, um, that you have on the right hand side of the assignment a type and Here. down there a value? Yes. Um, it's, it's somewhat confusing, at least from current C. Okay, uh, the comment was uh, this is a declaration and uh, th this is a Code, uh, code to, to be executed is this, the, uh, this is kind of ambiguous uh, once we look it in a C++ perspective. Yeah, that is true. But mm, I, the, the reason I prefer this syntax is right now the functional approach is to use type at the end of your de declaration. So uh, the way I r read this code is my int is an integer. And the way I read this code, my int is now assigned to 42. Like some in, uh, simple present tense English uh, sentence. And once we use these semantics, the, question, the declaration sentence still will be uh, viable. Okay. For example, private j just data, my int is an int. Uh, the meanings of these are uh, private, let's, let's uh, look at them in this slide. We have a few available semantics for our members. First, private shared. These are scope. That's what you ask. Private data are thread local, and shared data are only created in the main stack once, and is able to. Uh, uh, it is. It can be accessed by any thread. Uh, these are some functional uh, semantics. Uh, although I implemented all of these uh, for the sake of concurrency we will just use just for this conference if you uh, want to know more about these things you may uh, talk to me about them in the future then we have these semantics data future state memory and elements if all of these are omitted these are private just data are 
default declaration. Okay, and these are the guys that we are interested in. Uh, any questions? Now we are, I'm going to go into some Doppel code that uses these. Okay, let's start with scope sem semantics. It's pretty, it's pretty apparent that we have 10 copies of this task. They have a private my int, a shared my shared int, and you may have guessed already that there are tens of these, and there are ten of these, and there is only one of this. Um, any ambiguities? Okay. Let's see our monadic semantics. This is just for for an example. This we won't implement this. It's kind of easy, by the way. A just int is an integer that always should have a value. And maybe int is an integer that may have a value or can be null. And this is some usage of it. And we, are, we have some action semantics. And this is the core of this whole project. And data, my int, future, my int, uh, my future, and state, my state. Let's see what these guys do. Okay, so I have another state that uh, is called uh, that is transitioned into with a parameter called x and yields a, a value that is 42 plus x. So I assign this state with using three as a parameter to my data. Then I assign this state to my future using five as a parameter. And I'm using, uh, I'm assigning this plus 42 uh, state to my state, this guy, using my data as a parameter. So some of these are synchronous, some of these are not. And some of this, these are, is lazy, by the way. So how? <coughs> like this. So once I call this line, once this line is executed, the thing happens is this, a, and in th this is by the way a non-optimized uh, approach, normally it's optimized by the compiler, but right now think is this in a non-optimized way. This whole task is cloned, only the exec code of execution, not the data. The cloned task branches to this guy, uh, gets this uh, value by copy and assigns this to x, do some computation that takes time, which means we are blocked here till this ends. And this state in the end transforms into a ve value that its type is an int, and it's 42 plus x. So this is like a function call, right? And it has its own kind of loop that may branch to other states to do its computations in an abstract way. So I uh, we might do that in a non-blocking way by do ex doing the exact same thing to a future. So what happens here? Our task is cloned, uh, moved into another thread. That thread runs this code, and this line does not block until we access this guy. And this is simply a pointer assignment between states, that the first state, uh, the, the state, my state becomes a uh, non-parameterized uh, state, the reason is th there's a closure here. We are closing this x using the value in our my data variable uh, source. So what if I change this with this? Is this synchronous? What do you think? Any, any guess? <laughs> yes, it's not. The, since I did not uh, state any semantics here, this guy adapts its behavior from the, uh, from the semantic of the closure. So since we pass a future here, it, this, uh, it, the very first time that this future accessed, that's the time that this state is blocked. But this line does not. So let's compile this. We need some structures. We need to. We need to. We need. We need templates. Cl template classes for this. This. Not this. This is a raw 
data for this, but again, since we are not dealing with this, I'm going to omit this, this as well. And for these. Okay, so uh, our compiler will support any range independent from the runtime. The, the thing that we put here, that's a range. Okay, then it will support scope semantics. Then our action semantics and a concurrent stan standard output and input. These are the features. But since the e ease of code is goes uh, hard to easy in a descending way, so I'll start from these. And uh, since you have already uh, have guessed, all our logic and all our backend code depends on assignment and access, member access. So we need a unified interface to implement these, in, uh, these uh, structures. And the reason is, uh, since these are compile time features, we don't need an, uh, an inheritance or pointer typecasting uh, action. So let's use some concept like uh, interfaces. If only we had con concepts right now, I could have implemented them using those. OK, we have a set. Set accepts a reference to our whatever type we have, and a few parameters if it's a state. Otherwise, it's just the this. And our member access is a get parameterized by return type. This means at least we should get something. It can be whatever the code demands. So yeah, we if we had concepts. I could implement it this using those. Let's start with st standard input and output. It's quite easy. Let's create a class that stores a private mutex and only uh, has a get function that returns a constant string. Let's lock this whole function to, uh, to retrieve our value. Once we return that value, the destructor of this standard library function uh, um, type will unlock our mutex. This is quite C11101. Why do you return constant? Constant string. But you return it by value. In fact, you don't want to return constant string. Here, uh, the question is uh, I should not return this string as a constant because I'm returning it by value. Right. Right. Well, uh, for, this is for the sake of constant correct, correctness, but it, well, it will you, work you, the you other way as well. Where the const goes after the get. I mean, if you want a const method, then the const goes after the get, not before the return type. Okay, the, uh, the, the statement was, this belongs to here. Yeah, right. But you, I'm, you mean that to be a const? But I'm locking my mutex. I'm changing my int right. okay, so some private member that will invalidate that. Am I right? You can make that mutable. That ah, okay. Then it, this function would become a const. Yeah, right. Okay. Right. You can call it on a const. Let's sum it up. Uh, if I made a mutable yeah. uh, uh, mutex, then uh, this function could get uh, could become a const function, and this this is right. Yeah. Here? Whatever, and then he upgraded to C++ 11 and suddenly it was an error. Interesting. The right now, this, this code compiles. The issue is that in 98, um, there, were, there were practical applications for returning by value const. Scott Myers talks about it. Okay. But, in four, it, um, yeah, but in 11, it, it now conflicts with group semantics. So it's not a good idea. It's still legal. It's just not useful. But it was a warning or something. But we have warning as error. It might give you a warning because it's going to mess up group semantics. Uh, okay. I have a question about that. Though. If it is the case, the reason that we were told to do that in C98 was so that C++ so that if I return something from an arithmetic operation of two values, I, sh if I miss say misplaced an equals in a comparator operator. It could overwrite that, and that's different than behavior of ints. Yeah. So it's non. Uh, expected, but That's now it is expected because we're told to remove the cons. Okay, so the argument and statement was, should I remove this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can have a 
constant on the other side, on the receiving side. Here. Here? Yeah. Okay. Then that was what are okay. And we have a stand standard output which has the same kind of interface. All right. And this is the output way. Th the, this this guy only had a get function, and this guy only has a set function. Th th is this correct? <laughs> 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 All right. L let's go to scope semantics. This is our thread local and shared thread shared uh, variables. Uh, for Pride mem members, in the real implementation, yes, I have encapsulated my type. But right now, since our code will be a minimal runtime implementation, we don't need those. Just use the type itself. And if I, for the sake of this conference, use that enc encapsulation, probably our compiler would eliminate that during compilation. So let's get rid of it. But for our shared members, first uh, we must guard our data uh, for uh, simultaneous accesses, so we will have an internal mutex the way that we have in our standard output and stand standard input. But for the set operation, we should not forget to forward our R values, otherwise there can be some uh, issues about more than uh, copies that are more than once, so we should be careful about that. Let's implement this. So we are storing a type as a member and f a guard for that type for that member. So our get uses whatever this member returns. That's a forward. Uh, uh, that's a trading type that is get from this member, and we uh, guard this get by using the lock, lock guard that we used earlier before. So we return whatever we get. Any questions? OK. So set is kind of trivial. So we might have more than one uh, value, uh, but at least one is mandatory. So I use two t uh, t uh, template par parameters for that. We guard our data. We set. We pass the values with reference because the only cop copy operations are done during the member access, which are in later slides. Then we return this for the sake of chaining assignments. And since we need to be careful about our R values, we need a second type of set. Uh, I'm aware of the fact that this guy will return a reference. So once I add an add a, uh, percent here this becomes an R value and just pass this along and the crucial part the action semantics our synchronization uh, async calls everything will happen here so we have a few f uh, action semantics uh, these guys are not uh, a part the, the part of this uh, are not included in, in the slides but uh, we may talk about this once we finish our talk so Data, future and state. We will use that as use those as a template parameter to specialize our member types. Uh, member member types? No, uh, action semantic mem member types. And let's make some forward declarations to make this less painful. Okay, so we have a task task member uh, sp specified with a enumeration value from this plus the value that it will transform in the end. This is the trailing type that doppel member declarations use. And if it's a state, it might be called more than one parameter. So this is for these TSs are, uh, belong to states. So for our data members, let's shorten this up with our T. For future members, again, let's shorten this up. And for our states, Let's shorten this with SM, but uh, we should not forget uh, forwarding our TSs. So for the data members, this is 
like the most simple date, uh, member type because it has value semantics. Everything is copy. Everything is synchronous. It's like our regular variables in or regular types in our C++ code. Uh, we have a special uh, literal assignment uh, setter. Other, other than that, uh, the semantics for assigning data members to data members, future members to data members, and state members to data members are well defined. One is a copy assignment. One is a the other one is a copy assignment plus synchronizes this. It's uh, the way that AMP uses its features as well. Today, if you had a chance to go to that talk, and uh, a set assignment uh, to a state member is a synchronous call. It's like a function call uh, and a literal assignment. All right. So we store a data with type T. And we get that. So uh, what I've learned uh, when I watched last year's going native talks, and as well as the talk from yesterday, if I'm correct, that returning a value without its reference, if the value is small enough, is optimized better by the compiler. But since I'm not aware of this T's type, if, if it has some uh, heavy copy operations internally, Let's use a const reference for that. OK. A set is quite easy. If it's a literal, it's a direct copy. If it's a data member, it's a direct copy of its internal data member. If it's a state plus its arguments, it's a call. But right now, uh, for the sake of uh, object-oriented approach, we should not repeat our code. So instead of initiating a clone or initiating a call, let's create a temporary feature that is synchronized here in order to uh, in order to start this call in a lazy fashion in, in the same thread that we are. So uh, what should we have in mind is that our futures will be able to call lazily or uh, asynchronously. So this call is a lazy call. This flag is, is lazy. Any questions? All right. Then we may set uh, our data member a future member, which is a synchronous operation for our future. This is blocks. And that's the definition. Now the trivial part, the future members. Future members are uh, members that uh, their values are assigned asynchronously or synchronously depending on the way we call that. So we need to at least, by the way, we, we should be able to pass these along, diff along different, different threads or capture them in our states. Uh, so that's why we use a shared future instead of a regular future. Then uh, we might uh, Use, uh, we might uh, assign a value to this feature using a synchronous call or a direct data member uh, data member access. So we need an internal promise to make sure that this feature's value can be assigned to however we want. It can be in another state, in the same state, or in the call itself. Uh, OK, any questions? So uh, we have a future, uh, we have an interface for our future members, sets and gets. Set data member is direct forward for our internal promise. Future member uh, set uh, for future members is uh, the same as assigning a shared future to another shared future, which uses value semantics and is safe, therefore. And assigning a state member to our futures is a call uh, that is lazy if this guy is true. Otherwise, it's a st start a async call. And if it's a literal, again, it's like a data member set. And get is a synchronous value access, which is forward to our shared future to retrieve our value. Let's sort this. We have a shared future. We have a promise. And get is get from our future. First, future equals data. If we assign a data, let's use uh, uh, let's not pollute our internal promise because we will need it, that in our async calls. So let's use another f promise. 
get uh, our future from it and assign it to our internal future, set the value, return this. So this is not a, a trade creation method. This is just a forwarding the value. This is just forwarding the value. So if it's a value, same method. Internal uh, another promise, get future, set value, return this. Okay, if it's a feature, oh, there's, there's a question. Um, I don't want to uh, mess with the stored promise, but it seems to me that you're replacing the stored future, uh, which the stored future will then have no connection to the stored promise. It will have. Uh, the question was, uh, if we don't want the, if if you don't want to uh, pollute our internal promise, so uh, aren't we doing that here by uh, disjoining them from each other? And the uh, answer is, yeah, we are doing that, but the reason we are not polluting our internal promise is because it, is, it will be uh, used once we assign a state to our future members. Is it clear or should I discuss it a little bit more? Let's get to the state assignment. Okay. <laughs> Any other question? All right. Uh, again, uh, we are assigning a shared future to another shared future. It has a value semantics, so it's safe. And the hard part, not that hard. Okay, we are assigning a state to our uh, future. The reason for this, our state might have more than uh, might have parameter parameters, and this call should forward every single parameter that it has. So, first the state, second the lazy flag. Third, the arguments. First, we create, uh, we uh, store our internal promise. Uh, we initialize our internal promise. Then, we get a feature from it. Then, we start an async call that re returns void, which will be forgotten, because the uh, value will be assigned using this promise that we have created here. So, if it's lazy. The flag is deferred, which is, uh, which is delaying the function call. If it is, a, uh, it is false, then it's an async call. Now we have a, a, a lambda here that uh, gets these guys as, with their reference, then creates a task loop that we will implement in the future, uh, in, the, in the next slides. Passes, uh, passes our input state as the initial state. This is our promise in order to be able to set uh, the value of this feature and the argument. So, what is this? This is our runtime loop. Uh, remember that uh, in our previous slides, once I assigned a state to our future, I said that the task is cloned. The clone task starts operating its own loop, and once it is able to yield to a value, then it assigns that value to our future. So that loop is the foundation of our every single task and is a, uh, it, it is uh, possible to clone these t loops as many as we want. That's a requirement by the way. We will, uh, we will implement our task loops with that requirement in mind. So we, we, we are creating these loops, we are passing this uh, input that we take, get from here as our initial state. We are passing this promise to be able to yield, yield then our uh, arguments. All right, so states. States uh, have, uh, may yield to a value plus may have parameters, so it's a, it has an inf interface like this. It stores a callable. A callable that must be that is able to transform into a value. This is a yield keyword in Doppel. The stored callable must be able to set the next callable in, all, in order to has its own branching loop. So we are we need to support transition. Therefore, this these two requires an encapsulation of start function. Plus, the stored callable must be able to capture some environment. Uh, what do I mean? I uh, remember the code from previous slides that here. All right. <laughs> okay, this this one, this guy. W uh, this is a state that accepts one parameter. Once I assign it to another state that has no parameter, this state b 
becomes a state that has that is transitioned into or assigned without any parameter. So we have two specialized uh, template inst uh, instantiations for these states. It's like a uh, variadic template uh, using recursive initialization to decay into a state that has no parameters. So let's start with, okay, where are we? Yeah. Let's start the one with without parameters. So it, use, it stores a function which returns void, gets a promise by, very, uh, by reference, gets a state, state by reference, gets another state by reference. What are these? This is yield. This is how we assign the value of our future. This is the, uh, the state that we get from our task loop that we will assign in order to branch. So this is not owned by us. This will be given us. We will assign another state to it. And once our function ends, our task loop will branch to that guy. And this is a state uh, that, uh, that represents our finish. If we assign this to this, it means we are done. But we should not forget that if we assign this guy to this guy without setting the value of this guy, our thread will lock forever. So we, we must be careful about that. That's the, compiler, that's the thing that uh, Doppel compile handles inter uh, internally. So our get will return this using its type. Uh, that's a good call, by the way. I love it. OK, if we assign a state to a state, it means let's copy this function pointer to our internals function pointer or internal function object. So uh, assigning uh, data or future features to states has no meaning. It's kind of it kind of uh, it, 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 it does not work with our approach. So let's not assign. Uh, let's not uh, declare those. And we, we might also want to uh, assign our state a. Code that uh, that uh, code of execution. So, a function declaration in this case becomes a literal for our state number. So, uh, if, we, if we assign uh, any lambdas or uh, functions that are declared uh, externally, that becomes an uh, assignment for uh, states as literal. So, uh, assigning st uh, states to uh, assigning a state uh, that has no parameters. No, uh, assigning a state with parameters to a state that accepts no parameters, it creates a closure. And this is the piece of code that creates that closure. We are assigning a, threat, a, a state that yields into value of t with arguments of ts. And we provide the arguments. So our internal state becomes a state that captures those uh, parameters. And this is the method of it. We create a lambda, lambda uh, we pass the promise, we pass the next uh, state, we pass the finished state, plus the in, inside of this lambda we pass our arguments, and since the signature, signature match, this code works. So we return this to be able to chain our calls. Now, the states with parameters. By the way, are, do we have any questions? All right. So, by the way, what I have done since the beginning is wrapping up what has been provided uh, in these uh, standard libraries in order to achieve a uh, narrative implemented backend of our lang language, which is lightweight, by the way. So, I hope good performance in the end. So, a get is access to this guy. A set is if the signature matches, it's direct set of the internal function. And if it's a literal assignment, in other words, it's a lambda assignment, uh, it's, uh, if the signature match, matches, then it's an internal assignment as well. Uh, do you have a question? OK. OK, the other crucial part, that the guy that is uh, able to be cloned, our loop. All right, we have a loop that uh, is simply an implementation of a state, state machine. It is able to branch to other states. It's able to yield, yield to a val value, and it is able to create other clones of itself. 
and it should not throw exceptions because uh, right now in double language exceptions has no uh, uh, counterparts so in this implementation if it's, if, it's, if an exception has been thrown it's a, it's an abort call from the standard library and in our initial stage should accept parameters for the very very first uh, call to this guy will not have uh, parameters but once we have futures involved and parameter parameterized states then this initial state will need those parameters so our initial state should accept these so another requir requirement we should be able to clone this guy as many as we want we should be able to inst instantiate this without worry so aside from some internal handles we should not pollute our creator stack so uh, remember the future equal state assignments if I create an infinite loop that does this our th stack will grow exponentially in, in, and in the end it will crash so at least uh, we should do our we should try our best to avoid that or delay that as long uh, as as much as we can so that's the requirement for our task loop so uh, let's implement this. Uh, our task loop has a yield type and arguments for its initial state. Uh, our, uh, our task loop has an initial state, a handle for its next state, and an internal finish state that uh, represents the finish uh, uh, that represents the finish keyword in Doppel. Why is this a state? We will see that once we implement our loop and this is just a lazy, uh, just to be able to call our states lazily without creating our uh, without creating any other threats. So it's an internal handle as well. So our task loop. <coughs> I like overloading operators if they have meaning. So for the sake of this loop, I overloaded our function call operators operator with three, at least three. Uh, Mm, arguments. First is our initial initial state. Second is yield. Third, if exists, our third and fourth and next ones are uh, the arguments. So let's set our initial internal state with init that we get from here, plus pass the arguments to create a closure that accepts no other parameters. Then create a bool that re represents our endless loop that never ends. Then let's capture this guy, and the capture. Once we capture it, let's assign it to a f to false. And this capture, once we assign it to finish, it's a way to end this loop from anywhere we want. So our finish states captures running is running flag, and uh, since our uh, futures uh, or any uh, in any part of our code, we are able to assign this state to this state our internal handle for transition assigning this guy to false will end our uh, loop so uh, we need to be able to create that loop but first uh, our default next state is finish so if it's not stated it's finish then our, for our initial state let's uh, delay its call let's delay its call to a future we passing our parameters then create our loop. The loop is simple. As long as the flag is true, uh, the call our delayed function, which is our state. Once the call is, uh, the, the, once the call ends, which means our function has executed, has been executed, set uh, our future uh, the, uh, lazily our next uh, state. The, func the function that our next state holds. If it's finished, this flag will be false, so this will end. I put this whole loop in our try block so that if an exception is strong, I can abort our code. Otherwise, it's return zero. All right, so uh, remember that uh, in the future slides, uh, I assigned uh, once I assigned a future uh, state to a future I created this task loop so since 
our op operator accepts an initial state, a yield, and an argument if exists. This is the way we pass those values. Our input state we get from here, from outside. So there is no lifetime concerns. Uh, plus the promise that we create here, it lives in our future member, so it's safe to pass that as well. Then the arguments, if they exist. Since our uh, AS the st standard async call does not start our function if the flag is deferred, I need to be I need to state that externally in here. Any questions? All right. And our okay, yeah. Um, why are you controlling you controlling the loop with a simple boolean and not a condition variable or something? I'm well. <laughs> well, it's for, uh, the reason is, uh, I although I claim that we have this uh, necessary ingredients, I want to, okay, uh, the question was, since uh, we implement a loop of our own, why didn't we use conditional variables to end our loop? That's, that's a good approach, actually. But uh, for the sake of simplicity in this uh, talk, I preferred a building, uh, and that's a valid uh, Alternative method. Thank you. Any other question? All right. So we the, these are the blocks that building blocks that we need, and the only thing remains is generating our code. So we are almost ending this uh, slides. I'm going to show you some code conversions. So. It's a pseudocode, so the reason why I put this like this because I'm, I will do a little demo to show you how this conversion is being done. So, okay, first we declare our range, the initial number of threads that are being created as a const int. Then, a global st uh, output and input uh, uh, bindings for our standard output and standard input, mutex internally. Then uh, I declare our shared members. Then I declare an array of each private member for the sake of data-oriented approach. If I put every single uh, private member next to each other, once the first thread access that value, the next ones will get it faster thanks to our hardware cache. So uh, then uh, I declare our task body as a lambda. Actually, this is the main conversion that has been done by the compiler, that is done by the compiler. Uh, it declares a task loop. It declares its states. Inside of that, those states, it might declare other local, local members and some other program code like execution of arithmetic operations, assignments, etc. Then start our loop. This is a declaration. This is not a synchronous call. Once we declare this, and once we have this value, we iterate over this uh, uh, over st standard async using this task body as our uh, function and range as our copy uh, number of copies. So this is our pseudocode. And uh, since it was quite easy to uh, wrap, uh, wrap all the stuff from our uh, libraries, we might uh, wrap other things in the future. What are these? These are bind for partial applications. Tuples for, for an native tuple type, like uh, my int equals int space int that may, might resemble a future in, in uh, might resemble a tuple in the future. Actually, I have a proposal in my project site. Collections using stud array, stud vector. Uh, element members, uh, we might talk about uh, this once we finish this talk. They are off record. Uh, uh, we might talk them off record. So, member members to, for heap allocations. Once members, uh, again, see the project site or talk to me later about what does, does this mean. Uh, and Soul members, again, you may, might want to talk about this, but simply soul members are members that can only be held by a single thread un, until they are released. They are, uh, they are the way to implement uh, buffers if used in conjunction with collections. So this is the project website. Uh, every, every single thing that you have seen here uh, can be found here as well as the, ma the link that I provided in the beginning of my slides and you may contact me using this mail. Do you have any questions? 
All right, I want to see you some, I will show you some Doppel code. Yeah, uh, but the, the code that I've, I'm sh uh, I have shown here, uh, I did not have, I, I didn't uh, execute any benchmarks. But the previous implementation that I've concluded in January, uh, a brute force approach for a hard problem uh, is uh, 3.1 times faster once we give a ra range uh, the value of four. So it's quite there's there's a little bottleneck in during the, the clones and the synchronization, but aside from that, the uh, runtime or, um, work is not that heavy. Sorry? The question is, did I play with the? the Intel uh, no, uh, Intel Haswell architecture, no, I did not. Uh, the first question was, uh, did I, do I have any benchmark results? Uh, not for this code, but the previous implementation that uh, is much talented in terms of <laughs> language features. Uh, I have some uh, values, and it's uh, for the range value of uh, for uh, the range four. It's 3.1. All right, so some code. So I have a Doppel code uh, to test the features that we implemented here. So it is, all right, let's see, Doppel, Doppel. This is. Choose application. Can you see it? Like, should I zoom a little bit? Okay. Does anyone know how I can zoom using Sublime Text too? Option. Comment. Did I add any plus? Yeah. Okay. Comment. No, it doesn't. Well, do that. Like this? Yeah. Yeah. Then comment plus. It doesn't do oh, that. Okay. Maybe not that. <laughs> All right. Let's see this. Or this. Oh, oh, okay. Please work. No. <laughs> 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 what? Let's try another uh, text editor. What's that? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> sorry for sorry for not having a syntax, syntax highlighting. Okay, so we have a task that ha is cloned once in d during our uh, initial state. It will this number will increase during our execution, and in the end, it will end as a t task group of one. So we have a few uh, data named foo, which is an int. We have a future named z, which is also an int. Then we have a shared mem member that, also a, that is also an int. Before we look at the rest, let's see what this compiles into. What is it? No. 
All right. Data for future Z and shared Sh. First, we declare our range as a constant int, then our input and output globally, then our uh, foo and z, the, the reason of this order, because this is the way, uh, this is the order of the access inside the states. And finally, our shared data member, Shay. Uh, okay, then let's go to this. Right, initially, we output that th uh, we, we, we are able to get into this state. Then we assign a value. Then we assert that value in the compiled code. I, I did it by hand. Then we transition into bar. So let's see this code in our compiled code. So remember that we have a task body, body to th uh, that defines our code of execution, and which is called this many times by stud async. We capture everything we have by reference so that our, the stack of our main uh, uh, process is not polluted, polluted by the local variables uh, declared here. Then uh, we pass the t uh, task ID in order to be able to get our values from these arrays. Then this is what we are going to yield. Then we create our task loop. Remember the pseudocode from these slides. Then uh, we get references from these guys, the element that, we, that belongs, belongs to us. That's just for the sake of simplicity, to be able to use these references directly to set or get data. Then we create our state uh, forward declarations for our states. We have an init state, we have a bar state, and we have a tar state that accepts a future parameter of int. So these are forward de declarations for these states. Then we assign values to these states. In the, f uh, the first state is init, output a va value, assign 42 to foo, assert it, and branch. So output set our value, uh, assign 42, assert it, uh, Output the, the fact that we it worked. Then uh, transition uh, set the next state. If we set init here, it is a re it's, it's not a recursive call. Remember, we implemented a state machine. It will loop without polluting our stack with uh, function call pointers. So uh, remember that our T task uh, loop uh, is able to pass uh, the y y yield, the next state, and finish to every single state. So uh, every single lambda assignment to our states should have should uh, must declare these, even though uh, it does not use those. So second bar output that the state transition worked, then create an internal state. And in that state, create another state that, yield, that yields a value. And once uh, you, uh, and in that state, branch to this. So rem uh, remember that th in order to, for this code to be executed, I need to branch to this or assign this to a future or a data. So remember that we created a z future named Z Let's assign this guy, this whole guy, to Z. And this creates an this starts an asynchronous co uh, call. And in the C++ code, I uh, assert uh, Z with, uh, I assert check the Z with 99 to make sure that this branch chink has worked. So then the, with the value we acquired from uh, this call, I branch to tar. Let's see the C++ code. By the way, do you have any questions? I'm not looking at you. Sorry for that. All right. So, so we have uh, uh, we have printed uh, state transition works string, then created created another state that is called temp. In that state, we created another state 
that uh, to in order to make sure that our transition in our clone task works, we yield a value and set our next as finish to make sure that our future will end up with a value. Then, uh, in this, uh, by using this temp, we assign this value. By uh, this false, remember this. This is not a lazy call, so this code does not block till here. We make sure that it's 99. We uh, log our result. Then we branch to next state. And finally, in the tar, we accept a parameter named param with the type of int, which is a future. If I omit that, right now it's, it will not compile. But once we have uh, variable templates with, uh, in the latest C++ standard, I will be able to omit this guy and declare our uh, internal function object in our states as a template variable. So in the, in the future, uh, this branching will be more s uh, smarter than it already is right now. So we assert that our forwarding our value of z worked by checking its value, comparing its value with 99. Then we log our, res uh, log our success, then assign a value to shared member, check the assigned value, foo is 42, so our shared value should be 42 as well, then output uh, uh, our success, then finish. So here, again, we have a yield, we have a next, we have a finish, plus the parameter that we forward. And we make sure that it is the value we want. We log the, the result, then we assign foo to our shared member. We assert its value, we log the result, and we finish. Okay, these were all the de declarations. In order to start our program, we need to call the loop that we created here, here, with our initial state, and with the global yield that we declared. So th that's our main code. And we have a utility code that uh, is uh, defined, which is a for loop that creates uh, this many tasks using this callable. It's quite easy. And we simply make sure that our main function of this returns zero without er errors. Any questions? All right. Yeah. So, uh, is that finish required or will it be implicit? It's implicit, but for the sake of, again, simplicity, uh, I put it here to make sure that this is our final, uh, final state. Uh, the question was, uh, is this implicit? Uh, yeah, normally if I, do, if I don't put it here, it is, uh, I, impl implied, but since uh, I want to write a readable code that uh, re resembles what it does without any ambiguities, so I put a finish declaration here. So this this works. <laughs> uh, I have a ter where where am I? Where's my terminal? All right. C++ now, C++ now. All right, let's run this code. And this is the speed of it. <laughs> it started with initial state. It assigned a value to our data. It worked. Then uh, it assigned, uh, it's, it transitioned into another state. In that state, we created another state that we use to assign our future. In that state, we, we used another transition. It worked. Then our value for our future is set so that this assertion didn't fail. Then we transitioned into tar using the value from this future. Checked it. Assertion worked. Then we uh, checked uh, if our shared members work, which 
is okay, then we end it. All right, any questions? This is the end of our talk, so. So one thing, I haven't really seen any sort of conditionals. Is it possible for tests to be <laughs> Yeah, it, it is, but uh, if, since this, uh, the question is, do we have any condi conditions, and I want to enhance that question, just do we have any other con control structures for our code? Yes, I do, in the language standard, standard I have, but since this talk is mainly focuses on concurrency, I omitted those part of it. I can show them in you personally. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, when, when it synchronizes with all the others. Yes. Do you use like generation or something to make sure that, that jump is, that synchronization point is part of the current bench? Uh, before I uh, repeat my question, uh, your question, uh, are you uh, talking about the barrier that I have introduced before? Okay, the question is, uh, do I use... Uh, Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, the question didn't make any sense, but I I I kind of understood what you are trying to say. Uh, the barrier uh, the internals of the barrier how can I implement it by the very first thing that I can think of in, by intuition is using the very low level structures of semaphores, which we all hate, I know, <laughs> especially Sean. But yeah, uh, w there are a few methods to uh, implement that, but right now uh, I don't have it with my slides. Questions? All right. Well, I guess I have two things. Um, one, um, how is this going to scale as your DOPL code gets larger and more complex? Okay. I mean, right now, this translates into one one piece large, of large code. Large yeah. <laughs> with embedded lambdas. Yeah. I mean, I mean, how how do you foresee kind of breaking this up so that it's so that you can scale, you know, make it scalable and maybe even compose? Yeah. The DOPL sources. They well, the con uh, the con concern is uh, how can this scale? How much does the scale. Well, uh, I, for example, I, I, ha I have, actually I have a few benchmarks, but not values. Okay. See that we have created only one task. For example, with using this MacBook, I was able to boost this value up to for, uh, 40,000. All right, yeah. I think he's not asking about number of tasks, but code size. Code size, oh. Yeah. Well, uh, even we we didn't see any custom type declarations here or other kind of uh, things that might uh, give us the opportunity to do this uh, to break this piece of code into multiple source files. But uh, right now uh, the limitation is uh, what Clang but I guess requires. So yeah. Each one of these tasks seems to be no matter how complex the task is, it seems to be. Com translated into a single function. Yes. That has internal state. Yes. But uh, this is only this is only uh, true for this task. If I have any other custom types that implements its own type of members and states, that guy will go into another source file mm -hmm. and will be compiled into another C CPP file. So can you don't you don't illustrate that here one task you know, spawning other tasks then, so to speak? Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Questions? And I guess the other thing I noticed was if you go back to your main.cpp. Yeah. yeah. Up at the top, the Here. standard array, your performance wise, that's maybe not the best thing. Yeah, I, I'm aware of that. Have, uh, well, normally I don't use this. My real implementation defines this uh, data-oriented behavior inside of this type that I normally put. Yeah. In other words, uh, the question was: This is 
this might uh, cause, cause me pain if I try to scale too much. But uh, normally in the real implementation, I don't use our raw integers. I implement another integer that is able to scale as much as I want using an internal co collection that is applied every single internal member. For example, if I have a custom type that is consists of that consists of two integers, for that type I have a special collection that stores every single member separately. So there is no difference between the notion of a single member or or a member uh, or uh, or an array of members of ten. So yeah. I have a, in other words, I have a custom collection that is able to scale well. Okay, another question. Well, I just wanted to ask this questioner if he's talking about a cache sign and stopping. I meant I'm false sharing. The of the data. Right, um, all on um, the same cache line. Yeah, um, where you were saying at the outset that you wanted to keep data together. Yeah. Um, so that you minimize cache misses. Y yes. Yeah, the statement was since we want data locality to make sure that our cache is not polluted, we need to be careful about our implementations, which in this case it's not that good, I'm aware of it. But normally the real double source code uses an, another kind of structure to make sure that it may scale better in the future. Okay, any other questions? Statements? All right, then, thank you very much. <laughs>